Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is September 11th, 2013, and Chris Sloan has uh, brought some friends with him. Um, yeah. Chris, uh, you want to describe... So this, sure. th this is one of those shows called uh, I Know What You Did This Summer. Um, <laughs> no, we want to so, know what you did this summer. Yeah, we want to this summer. So Chris, why don't you jump in and introduce sure. some of these folks and tell us what you were doing in Ireland this summer. And, and the focus of the show will be on sort of what the experience was like and then what you all are doing to bring it back into your classrooms this fall. So... That's my introduction, Chris. Go for it. <laughs> sure. Um, so first of all, um, the, these people are all associated with the Michigan State Masters in Master of Arts in Educational Technology. So some people actually did it completely online. Some people did it overseas in Galway, Ireland. Some people did it as a hybrid program um, at East Lansing and at their homes. So actually, it's a pretty wide range of people who may or may not know each other. Um, but, you know, the common denominator is there's a bunch of really dynamic um, teachers here. And, uh, you know, we always like to get together with dynamic teachers, as it turns out, um, because uh, good things happen and the, the conversations are amazing and, and this group is no different. Um, and so um, I thought just getting people together in this program, if, if you just get the common denominator of really good teachers together, good things will happen. And so, uh, the and I idea... Think it, I think it's true, Chris, if I could check. I think, has anybody been on the show before? Marcy has. Marcy, oh, of course, yes. Yeah. But, but mostly everybody is here for the first time, so that's really exciting. We're always happy to have new folks on. I'm Nathan, welcome. <laughs> okay, Chris, go ahead. Okay, so um, uh, what I thought we would do is um, just kind of stick with the theme of the last couple weeks in Teachers Teaching Teachers. We've kind of talked to teachers about what they've been doing lately and what interesting things they're working on now. Uh, so we've talked to art teachers and people associated with KQED, Do Now Project, and, and uh, Guru Learning. Um, and so tonight it's this group that's associated with Michigan State's Masters in Educational Technology. And one of the things that I was struck with on the site before we get to quick introductions is um, the little description of the program I thought was pretty good. Um, it says the program has two goals, an easy goal and a difficult one. The easy one is to learn about technology. Some students may already know a lot about technology and some may know less, but learning how to use technology is the easy goal. The difficult goal is figuring out what to do with the knowledge of specific technologies, technologies to help students learn. And I thought, you know, like that's really at the crux of it is, you know, how we're helping our students learn. Um, and so the, the frame of the show is what did you learn this summer and how is that manifesting itself in this year? But really we talk about what interesting things people are doing and what's on their mind. So um, with that, I thought we would just do a quick round of introductions. And Paul, you might um, just kind of steer us through this because I realize I have to get a power adapter. Um, <laughs> so if we could just go around and, and so just say... So if you disappear, we'll, you'll be back, right? Right, it's nothing yeah. personal. Right? And it, <laughs> it goes alphabetical by first name. So Annie, jump in. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, my name is Annie Kim, and I actually got married about a year ago, so it's now Saitsma. Um, I am actually a second year teacher um, at Cedar Springs uh, High School. Ooh, the feedback is really loud. Yeah, um, I got it. Yeah. Nathan, you want to turn off the broadcast and just listen here. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Annie. Okay. Go ahead, Annie. Um, so I am actually an English psychology teacher for 10, 11, 12th graders um, at again Cedar Springs Middle or Cedar Springs High School. I'm in my second year of teaching, and I will be finished with the MAET program. Um, May. So I'm taking three classes right now online to finish up and then two in the spring and I've been doing the cohort program so I unfortunately didn't get to go to Ireland but I'm really jealous of our city. <laughs> cool. So uh, what grades did you say you're teaching again? Uh, I teach 10, 11, 12th grade. 10, 11, oh okay great. Blair, you're next. Hi. Hi, I'm Blair Winters. I teach uh, middle school art so I teach 6th, 7th and 8th grade art at Lance Cruz Middle School East in Chesterfield. Uh, I did both years of my MAET experience in Ireland. I was in Dublin last year and this year I went to Galway and it was fantastic. Um, 
What else are we supposed to talk about here? So you said art, not language yeah. art? No oh, art, art, yeah. Oh. Okay, so you should listen to last week's broadcast too. I and did, next I watched week, some so. of it. When okay, I got invited, great, yeah. I immediately investigated and then I was like, wow, <laughs> they should have invited me last week. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll be back with our teachers. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, cool. And just to speak to the um, study abroad um, cohort, because I've done it for both years, it's such an amazing experience. Last year, you know, it was really intense. You just kind of throw you in there, you start learning all this new technology, and um, you know, like Chris said, the easy part is learning the technology, but then to come back home and use it, you know, I slowly integrating it in a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, and I just had such a great experience last year that I had to go back because not only is it a program where you're learning technology, you know, to improve our students' learning, but it's very much a support group. So you're living with these people you're in class with all day, you're learning from them at home, at school, and I mean, that's really what made the experience for me. How long do you spend there? In, Gal in Ireland, we were yeah. there for about a month both times. Yeah. So, cool. so it's like about, it's four weeks of class, but I mean, the, fir the last week, you know, pretty much everything's due, so. Cool. Yeah. Bob, you're next. I'm Bob LaRock. I teach French 1, 2, and 3 in <laughs> an ACT prep class at John Glenn High School in Bay City, Michigan. Um, I, too, just finished the MAT program with Michigan State. I did the first year all online, the second year in Dublin, and then the third year this past summer in Galway. Very cool. Um, and that, you said French, right? Yes. And what was the other three? ACT? What? It's an ACT prep course. ACT is what? Sorry. <laughs> um, the uh, American College Test. Okay. Got it. Got it. So we do test strategies and practice tests and kind of review English, math, reading, and science reasoning. Um, I, I, I don't know your first name, but Lauren. Ms. Villa Luz here. Lauren, sorry. Lauren, that's okay. Welcome Hi, um, I'm Lauren Villa Luz, and I teach Spanish. Um, and going into my fourth year of teaching, I teach at St. Lawrence School in Utica, Michigan. Um, I teach kindergarten through eighth grade. Um, kindergarten through sixth grade Spanish, and then I teach a seventh and eighth grade broadcasting and media arts elective. Um, wow. This past summer was uh, my first year um, in the East Lansing cohort program. Very cool. So, um, by the way, many, many of my students in the South Bronx um, are Spanish speakers, so we should uh, see if we can make some sort of connections. To Absolutely. Sounds good. Marcy, introduce yourself, please, and tell us what you've been doing this summer. <laughs> Hi, I'm Marcy, and I um, teach in St. Catharines, Ontario. I teach at uh, Ridley College. I teach fourth grade, and I finish the first year of the MAET program in Galway this summer. Nathan from Bangalore, right? So, sort of an interloper, but I invited him to come anytime he'd like to. So jump in and introduce yourself, please. You'll have to unmute. Yeah. You I'm from Grand Rapids, Michigan. There you yeah, go. I'm from Grand Rapids. Great. I'm from Grand Rapids, Michigan, actually. Oh. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I had the wrong person in mind. That's no, no, you've got me. You've got me. I'm in Bangalore. I'm, I just woke up. I'm just getting ready for school. Oh, you here. are in Bangalore, but you're from Grand Rapids. Okay, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's correct. No, I'm, I'm actually finishing my MAT program through Wayne State University right now. In May, I should be done, um, so I'm looking forward to that. Presently, I'm teaching English Language Arts, grade 6, grade 7, and then Global Perspectives, grade 9 and 10. And we're trying to get Nathan to join us at youthvoices.net, so that'll be fun if your students can do that. So, it's part of it. Cool. Um, you and might want to get some headphones or ear earbuds. Yeah, or just go in and out to. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Ray, welcome. Hi, I'm Ray. Um, I'm in uh, Fairfield, California, and I'm teaching at Rodriguez High School. Um, and I'm teaching math right now. This year, I'm doing geometry and statistics. Oh, and I was part of the East Lansing uh, hybrid program this summer. And finally, Renee. 
Hi everyone, I'm um, Renee Jure. I teach at St. John's Middle School, 7th and 8th graders. I teach um, all of the technology courses here. Um, this summer I started at MSU um, in East Lansing, so it was my first one at the uh, Summer Cohort, Cohort 1, the hybrid course. So looking forward to applying to the master's program. All right, that's introductions. Chris, do you have a question to start us off? I mean, well, I'm yeah. fascinated by how, how, how wide the various disciplines represented tonight are, so that's great to have you all here. Right. Okay. And, um, you know, one of the things when teachers go to school in the summer is, you know, I'm always curious, what cool things did you learn? You know, like uh, when you sit back and everybody's gone to school this summer, and uh, we won't really get to it, although you could say how that's manifesting itself. Just like when it's all said and done, um, what kinds of things stick with you out of all the stuff you learn? And now we're in the part of the show and the rest of the show that's called Jump In. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so go for it. I guess I'll, I'll start. Um, for me, um, it's had really big implications on my year. Um, going back to school this summer and um, becoming a student again and finding out about all these new tools and really um, kind of finding out a new perspective on how to incorporate technology in the classroom. And um, my particular passion is um, explaining that to other teachers in my building. Um, yeah. I know uh, it's something very foreign uh, to a, a lot of teachers. It's new. Um, it's really hard to keep up with. We have so many time demands. And um, so for me personally, I, I couldn't let it go. <laughs> um, I got so excited about all the work that we were doing and all the things that I learned um, that I had to go forward. And uh, we don't have uh, an ed tech coordinator in my building, so I um, asked her if I could take on that role this year and continue learning myself through educating the educators in my building. So that's really stuck with me. Everything that I've learned is to be able to continue, you know, passing on that enthusiasm, that knowledge, and um, really just the emphasis of how to incorporate technology successfully in the classroom so we don't have so many frustrated teachers out there. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I kind of took the same approach uh, this year coming back. Um, the big project for the year two in the study abroad cohort is the, uh, we have a big conference we put on. And so, you know, we, or we have to present and, you know, that kind of gave me the confidence to go in front of my staff who is not the techiest bunch in the world and, you know, really same thing, get them excited and advocate for technology in my building. So I did my first PD uh, two weeks ago, and it went pretty good. But, um, you know, I feel like there's a lot I, I could have done differently, you know, when teaching that audience. I've never taught that audience before. But overall, it's just, you know, getting them as excited as I am. So I'm on the same page with you, girl. Besides We're excitement, what, what were you teaching? What, um, what last you, year, I started, um, remind, I, I was the only teacher doing Remind 101. And I had mentioned it, you know, to a few teachers, and I had a good response, and they wanted to learn how to do it, too. So I... What is that? Say it again. That. I didn't Remind, hear you. Remind 101. Okay. I don't, tell me so, more. Um, it's sending text message reminders to students and parents. Okay. So they can subscribe to, um, you know, the internet phone number, and then I can send out text message reminders about assignments or things going on. Open house last week, I sent it out. So I did that to the staff, and I'd say probably... Um, over half of them got it, and they're using it, and they're coming to me and asking me more questions, and, you know, if I have ideas that I can help them with in other, other areas, so that feels good to be able to help them with that. I also showed them Weebly because I'm all about the accessibility of my content. Like, I want you to be able to get to it at home because that's how I am. If I'm, I want to be able to get to something no matter where I'm at, so I put a lot of my assignments on, on my Weebly, so I showed them that, and not as big a response with my staff on that is our Mind 101, but baby steps. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the coolest things about the MAET program for us is growing our personal learning networks. Mm -hmm. So I know we create a Facebook group with our MAET people. So one of the greatest tools that we have is really just utilizing our own knowledge that we have because we come from such different backgrounds when it comes to technology. And the group still exists, and it's not just of the group that I would belong to, but everyone else who kind of came before me as well. So 
Um, every once in a while, you'll see people posting, people we know or people we don't know, mm -hmm. some, hey, here are some issues that I have. Does anybody have any ideas? And right now, I know that the iPad classrooms are big. So um, we have a couple of teachers right now who put on posts like, um, I'm not sure how to do this with my iPad. Does anybody have any suggestions? And you really see people coming together, networking, and really just growing the learning experience. And I think for me personally, that has been really great because I have kind of a Rolodex of ideas right at my fingertips right there through everybody who really believes in the same thing and kind of is utilizing techno technology in the most innovative ways. Um, so things that have been existing not necessarily for educational purposes, but figuring out how to repurpose them and use it for education purposes. Do you have an example of that, Annie? Sure. Um, like Facebook, you know, of course it started out as a social network, um, and now you see a lot of people making Facebook groups within their classrooms. Um, people might do it for different hours within high school. So we can't see who's necessary. Just because we're in the group doesn't mean we're friends with one another. So we can't see kind of all the walls and the personal information, but we can communicate with one another in that. Um, I'm trying to think of another one. If anybody can think of another one, please jump in. Uh, um, Twitter? Yes. Oh, Twitter. Twitter's huge. Yes. I, use, I even uh, use Twitter. I even use Twitter unit with my, with my, with my, with my, with my, yeah, it's actually required for the MAET program, um, and I was an anti-Twitter person before I was an MAT-er, um, and I kind of we use it for a lot of purposes, researching. Um, I don't think I use it for I don't use it for personal um, relationships at all. It's all about I need to know how to do this. Has anybody tried this? Or even connecting with different authors or different researchers and getting a better understanding of stuff, or just connecting. It's been really interesting. I think Nathan was going to jump in there. Is that accurate? Yeah, I, I apologize about the earphone thing. I'll get it's some okay. next time. <laughs> um, our school, Canadian International, is a one-to-one -one iPad school. And uh, we use Edmodo quite frequently. Um, I don't know if anybody else uses Edmodo. I post all of my curriculum, everything, assignments, and contact with parents through that uh, network. I was wondering if anybody else uses that or has any familiarity with that. Uh, I think people I think in general people do. General but do. but tell, tell us a little tell bit more about, more about how what significance it's had in your classroom. classroom. Well, I, it seems that um, students now, I'm able to stay in contact with them um, much longer after school. I mean, last night I received a message that, 10 o'clock asking me about uh, a reading assignment. Um, whereas before this, uh, this resource was available, I, I probably would not have talked to the student. So it just makes me that much more accessible and, and, and easy to um, reach. And I've used that for Twitter, um, use Twitter for that. And my parent, my students, because they're high school students, they are, you know, they have Twitter all set up, and they will ask me at 10 o'clock at night, hey, what was the assignment again, or I don't understand this part, um, and that's really great. Um, the other thing I did is I um, set up a quiz for my kids on Twitter, really? where I would, I would tweet out the, the, or the words, and they had to tweet back at me what the answers was, and that was, they keep yeah. asking me, when are we going to do that again, when are we going to do that again, because they, they had so much fun with it. Yeah. I um, have a t class Twitter account, and I use it as a way to post images of my students' artwork and tweet them out to uh, you know the students that follow us and the parents that follow us. I don't have as big a following as I would like on Twitter from my students and my parents. Uh, if you guys have any ideas about how to <laughs> get them I would more be curious about that. about that too. Yeah, because I I mean I have maybe a hundred followers, but you know I have over a hundred students. But, you know, these are parents that I've had following for a while. And I get new students every 10 weeks, so I have to start all over with that. Uh, the life of an art teacher. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so, uh, well, are you interested in us joining? Oh, yeah, please do. <laughs> yeah. I no, I mean, uh, us in general, yeah. Uh, so it's not just the parents of your kids, it's others as well? Right, yeah. I would, uh, yeah. Everybody. So what's the Twitter handle? Uh, at art is MSC. that the way to say it? <laughs> so yeah. What, what is it again? At art MSC. 
at art underscore MSC. I just put it in the uh, feed. What's the last three letters? MSE. MSE, okay. Yeah, Middle School East. Cool. And those are middle school students, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. When I start, I started a Last year or the year before, you know, everybody had Facebook, nobody had Twitter. But then I've, I've noticed a move with my middle school students more towards Twitter because now all their parents are on Facebook. So they're not as, uh, I don't know, into Facebook anymore. They're more about Twitter. Mm -hmm. so, and um, both of these things are there. open in your school? Is Twitter and Facebook open in your school? I was asking you, Blair. <laughs> Sorry. Hello. Oh, oh, is it? Yeah, Twitter um, is Facebook is blocked. So that's actually why I started with it because no. uh, um, Facebook wasn't. I couldn't get to Facebook because I knew they were all there. I want to go where they are, mm -hmm. but I couldn't. Um, it was blocked at school. Actually, a lot, a lot of things were blocked at my district until just last year. Everything, YouTube was even blocked. Everything, mm -hmm. and Pandora. It was rough. Mm -hmm. Let's get better. <laughs> Because I listen to music all day with my students, you know, if they're working, get some tunes going. That's probably one of the toughest challenges, everything being blocked by your district. We come in uh -huh. with so many tools and things that we want to try with the kids and parents and families, and um, you got to work those channels with your tech director, your district, uh, to be able to open those channels up. Can you talk? Uh, oh, sorry. I was going to ask. Bob to just talk a little bit more about that because that's really um, the crux of a lot of people's issue. Um, Blair School sounds pretty open, but um, I would imagine other people here, um, it's not always as open in your um, environments because mine's not. And, you know, like how do you, uh, you know, go about opening things up like that? Is it just as easy as walking down the hall and talking to your tech director or yeah. is there more to it than that? Well, for example, today, um, the world language teachers at our school, we're creating web portfolios with WordPress. And I took my first hour down, and I can get into it as a teacher, but the students are all blocked. Um, so my plans were kind of shot. Um, and it took me just a matter of putting in a work request, saying urgent, need this unblocked. And within the hour, he was there and unblocked it for me. Oh, that's nice. Um, that one's kind of an easy one. Other things like Twitter and Facebook, those are still blocked. That would probably take a little bit more with administration and possibly the school board to get that opened up to be able to use that um, just due to the things that are posted on there um, and the availability to students. When you say it was unblocked for you and your students, right, do other kids in the school have – is it unblocked for them too or um, is it school-wide? More things are unblocked for teachers, so we can use them with our smart boards mm -hmm. or from our end of things. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the students, the students are pretty locked down. Um, as teachers find new tools, then we have to put work requests in to get them unblocked, get them approved um, before but students can have access. What I was asking, though, is when you get it unblocked for yourself, does that unblock it for everybody in the school? Um, oh. No, I have to request it specifically. Oh. Okay. I and think one of the other problems. With, oh, go ahead. I was going to say one of the things with the MAT program, it's not just teachers who are in the program. And so through the program, I've met some people who are actually um, working on the tech side of education. There's also a lot of administrators. So when we start talking about those types of issues that really hinder us or become obstacles, we kind of get to have a different perspective through our discussion from where the different sides are coming from. And I know that in talking with some of the tech directors, we were able to figure out different loops because some of it is um, legal based and you know things like that. So just to get a better understanding of it and try to figure out what are the different options that we actually do have in troubleshooting to get what we want without you know I guess breaking any rules or laws or things that they have out there. So there's been really valuable conversations within our discussions. But can I can I press you on that a little bit, Annie? I mean, what legal? I mean. I don't think there is any legal restriction. Well, so I mean, yes, they have to have they have to have a a, a system that can block, but right. I don't think there's any right. requirement to block anything. Like, well, I mean, there are different yeah. districts hold different types of tech standards. So some districts, mm -hmm. like my district, won't allow students to have email access on school computers. Email That's mine. Yeah, what kind of access? Oh, email, email, really? Yes. yes. Why? 
because they don't trust the students or because mm. there's not if we want to do it through our school email rather than a Gmail then that means the school really owns the rights but then it's too much managing so there's a lot of issues and there's a lot of different people that need to be addressed in trying to figure out how to find the how to find the right avenues to get this through um, and when I was talking to one of the tech people that I actually met through the program they were trying to there's a lot of different like codings that they have on their end that I was never really understanding and so knowing that that's the audience that we really have to kind of speak to we're slowly trying to like implement and figure out how do we go about it so it's not too much managing but that we can trust the kids to utilize technology efficiently um, and really just grow the literacy of technology within our buildings. Mm -hmm. I think the other piece that comes in with that go. is is um, at least for me I have middle school students and so it's like you have that age 13 piece there where it's like they can't really use some of the tools in school because they can't sign up for those tools because they're under the age of 13 so in, in high school it probably wouldn't be a big deal but at middle school level that is a big deal so to have them be able to communicate with Twitter and know you know I can demonstrate mm -hmm. it for them and demonstrate how to keep your settings safe in Facebook and stuff but for them to actually use it in school as a tool um, it's kind of a challenge yeah I, I agree with you because I have the same age group and I've actually taught tech classes as well but just to clarify with my Twitter like if they want to follow me at something they can do at home I kind of use it as a bridge to connect with them at home and any tweeting that's done from the classroom is done by me although I'll let them draft the tweets, you know, I'll, I'll have them, you know, come up with them, you know, what'd you learn today? Tell me 104 characters or less and we'll go through them, we'll pick the best one and I'll tweet it. But that is frustrating when you have all these great tools and you can't use them because of the various uh, blockades you have along your way. I think one of my biggest issues, while I do have Twitter open and I can get to YouTube and things like that, is our bandwidth. Like Glogster, forget about it. <laughs> I cannot use Glogster because it's just too slow. Mm -hmm. Marcy, how about you? You're elementary. Yeah, I have fourth grade, so I'm pretty lucky in my situation. Um, if I, we have a fairly open network, and then if I find anything, I can just email and they'll unblock it for me. And we run one-to-one -one iPad, um, one-to-one laptops for about 600 kids, so we have very good wow. bandwidth. So I'm pretty lucky I can't complain. Mm -hmm. I think going back to the question that was asked earlier in terms of what did we um, get out of the summer class, for me it was actually putting myself in the same situation that my students are in all of the time in terms of um, problem solving and becoming an independent thinker and trying to handle and manage so many different things at the same time and learn so quickly so much information like having five projects going at the same time and having them be fired at me all at the same time and then working Russ, through that collabor doing? collaboratively <laughs> Sorry. I'm just yeah. with lots of but, other but people. Be a little more specific though if you don't mind like what were the five projects that you were managing? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> more than five. <laughs> <laughs> Several, actually. Um, one of those was um, with people working collaboratively online to do a voice thread where we had to do the research and we had to use a Google Hangout and raise over in California and I had another person in Georgia and another person and so we had to figure out how to do that at the same time we had to figure out how to do the voice thread and meet the criteria so that was one project and at the other time it's like I was doing a network learning project where it's like my goal was to um, figure out how to make a, uh, a video a tutorial on an iPad so I had to do a screen capture of an iPad but yet we have PCs here so it's like okay what kind of programs can I use that will actually do this um, to make that happen at the same time or and at the same time doing a couple annotated bibliographies and research that I haven't done for 25 years so <laughs> it just um, that that was just uh, a lot and, and it was great it was a great experience because in my classroom the students, um, one of the goals that I have is to have them become independent thinkers. So all of their work is online in Moodle and then they have to all create their own, their very own blogs and demonstrate their knowledge of whatever it is that I'm giving them for the project. So as well as work collaboratively and work with others. So. And do you, do you manage that Moodle by the way? Um, our, it, it's kind of a consortium between 
three people. I manage the teacher side of it, but it's actually on a server that is um, housed at our uh, an ISD that's near here. So, mm -hmm. um, I want to ask just a general question to all of you because you know I know the the curriculum um, changes quite a bit uh, from year to year. It adapts to the latest uh, needs, you know. And uh, a couple of things that stand out when I look at the the overall arc of the thing is um, the, an emphasis on creativity in one of the years, right? If you look at Ken Robinson stuff, Sir Ken Robinson, his his work about how you know creativity, and a lot of other people are saying that that's an important thing to foster in schools. And then I know another year focused on the maker movement. It was the summer of uh, making. Uh, for a lot of people, and so I was wondering how, like those kinds of things, those um, the ethos of like teaching creativity and fostering creativity and and the making kind of movement, did that um, impact you, or what did you think of that? So I guess I could speak because I did um, the the maker um, kind of project. We went to a maker space when we were in Galway. It was called 091 Labs, and we visited this. Um, Say that with, again. It's called, it was called what? 091 Labs. 091 is the uh -huh. um, area code for the city of Galway, so that's why it's 091. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a space where, like a community center, where people with various interests could come and gather. And if you had an interest that you had a strength in, you could share your talent by putting on a workshop. So maybe it was on coding or 3D printing, um, drawing, and then the other members of the makerspace could come and take your class, and you could work collaboratively on projects together. So I think this more open-ended um, project-based learning is kind of how it's filtering into our schools and giving students the space to create things and kind of grapple with problems that don't have a clear answer um, but many ways of producing things and getting there and having something as a product at the end. Well, speaking to like project-based learning, I teach art, so I teach project-based learning. And kind of how I approach creativity in my classroom, technology aside, um, I generally try to give them do, do my age group because I have middle school. I usually try to give them, you know, so many requirements that they have to meet, which meet my curriculum standards. But then I tell them, you know, I don't really care what you do as long as you meet those requirements and really giving them the freedom to do that, but making sure that they're within boundaries so that, uh, you know, I can meet my curriculum standards. They really go to town with it. They, like, that seems, that really seems to work for me. And so, you know, project based learning is something that, you know, I, do all the time. So when you kind of integrate the tech with it, the creativity I've noticed is, you know, taking it up a notch. Well, and I think with the, you know, making stuff creative as a math teacher, a lot of my stuff can be, oh, here's this, you know, worksheet, go fill it out. And, you know, over the summer I realized that you can give the same assignment to, you know, 30 people. And if it's a good assignment, it shouldn't look the same for every single person. Um, and and so that's one of the things that I've been doing is, is trying to make sure if my assignments are about some sort of math thing that they get the math concept in there but their output should be personal to them so that they're not just copying from their from the person next to them because I see kids when I pull up in the morning every day they have their phone in one hand and their worksheet in the other because someone else sent them the picture of their homework and they're filling it out in the morning and <sighs> It's just like okay, we can do better that's, than this. We we can that's we can tech integration. Come on. Yes, it is. <laughs> and they are great at that. But you know, we can make the assignments more interesting to them if no one's going to have the same answer. Ray, do you have an example of what of, of what, what you're just talking about? Um, yeah. So in my geometry class, I'm le um, I'm reading the book called Flatland with them, mm -hmm. and. And it's a very short book, and um, so what I've having them do is after we read it in class, um, they have to just write a summary of it, and then they make a picture about what the chapter was about. So just one little picture visualization um, that t kind of sums up what, what they read about in class. And um, the last chapter was about how they, um, how the families are set up. And so 
you know, if the dad's a square, the son has to be a pentagon because it has one more side. And so what I had them do to make sure that they got the concept is they had to make a family portrait of their family. And it was just really interesting, like, how everybody got, like, super into it um, and, and um, like, thought it was really neat. What grades is that again? Uh, that was ninth and, ninth and tenth grade. Mm -hmm. well, for so, me, Ray, Ray, what different ways did they create? I mean, what they, what tools did they use to do that? Or could they use pencil and paper? Or could they um, use a computer? Or did you assign them something? Or could they choose what they wanted? Uh, I uh, I actually signed it when I had a sub because we were out for a training. Um, so they didn't go up to the computer lab, so they all used um, pencil and paper and just took a picture of it on their phones to post it. Um, but, and, and you know, because a lot of them are so new to this technology thing, I haven't gone up and showed them other ways, you know, like we have Photoshop on all our school computers, like I haven't shown them how to use that yet. And I'm hoping to kind of, like, by the time we're done with this book, show a progression of, hey, here's where we started out with pencil and paper, and here's where we ended up making these really cool pictures. I think for me, the summer creativity was, was one of the main focuses, at least in the year three program. Um, all the activities that we did let me look through what I do in my classroom, kind of through a creativity lens. How can I change the projects that I do? How can I change the assessments that I do? to allow kids to kind of shine and show their creativity. You're um, teaching French, is that right? Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Uh -huh. um, and I think the one important thing that I took away from it is not to put any limits on the projects or the assignments for the kids or, or any parameters that limit their creativity, um, to leave it fairly open-ended so that they can really shine and show you know, their strengths, whatever it could be. I'm going to ask you for an example, too, though. <laughs> um, it's hard to say now. Um, I'm still kind of revamping everything, but mm -hmm. example, so what are you rethinking? That's interesting. Yeah. Um, well, one big thing the kids do is they do um, they learn how to go to a restaurant and be able to order, ask for the bill, speak with mm -hmm. the waiter, speak with the people at the table. Nice. Um, and currently, I have it it's fairly scripted and fairly specific of what they need to accomplish. Um, so I think I'm just going to give them what the outcome needs to be and just let them have at it. I know. Um, for me, in foreign language, it is kind of nice to just be able to give them a problem because it's more real life. They can relate to it rather than saying, hey, you guys need to go create a dialogue of greetings. You have to give them a real life situation and let them create from there. That's been working. You know, I've, That's where I've seen the creativity in my classroom. It's too often it can become too scripted and it's not as realistic as it could be. Um, and I think that's the real goal, to give it as make it as real life as possible versus, you know, I memorized this phrase and we did this scripted conversation. And don't you feel that there's so much student ownership when there's that creativity? I mean, because for me, like, teaching English, for one, I do not like reading this same entire, same exact paper over and over when I'm grading it. So kind of letting the students have that freedom of choice as to what is it that they want to write about. When they're reading a book, different students are going to have different parts of the book uh, speak to them. And so having them really choose what it is that they want to read about or write about. And when they do that, I can see that there's less plagiarism issues. There's more honesty and there's just a lot of real growth and real life lessons and just discussions that we can really have. So I feel like with creativity, there's been so many great avenues of just uh, learning and just practice. And my focus has been really on how do you cultivate um, but I guess later, as since I'm teaching like the sophomores, juniors, and seniors, I think I had to start with how do you ignite or reignite that creativity? Because I think for like a couple of years, they haven't really been delving into that. So my focus has really been in creating a culture of creativity. So we're allowed to paint our walls in our classroom, so I did that. Um, it doesn't look like a traditional classroom, so I changed the setting of the lights. Um, there's bookshelves everywhere. So really just kind of letting them come into a warm space that allows, you know, that to be, it allows students to be inspired. So I think that was my first aim this year, and then hopefully I'll grow into um, just, I don't know, innovative practices and doing things age traditionally, but getting them to really think on their own and become independent uh, beings, really. 
So, Annie, one of the things that was interesting there, and is a question I have had in the back of my head, is is um, you didn't mention technology directly in that whole description, right? right. So, even though this is um, you know an ed tech um, show and it's an ed tech program that you're all in, is it about technology? Well, or, I mean, like, could the, you do what you're doing anyhow without technology? Yeah, and our program really tells us that technology, sure, it is the wire and the computers and, you know, what we all think technology to be, but it also is how to repurpose things, using everyday tools to, like, use basic technology, you know, and we have lots of discussions around a paper and a pencil and a marker and crayons. Those can all be technology also, and just how do you really use any tools that you have around you to really work. Um, but for me, my district doesn't have a lot of great um, reliable technology. So I have started using technology more as a resource in how to get things creative. So one of the big things that I have been working with and actually taught or talked about um, during my cohort program was Donors Choose. And I don't know if many of you guys are familiar with that, but basically it's a nonprofit organization where Teachers can sign up and they can pretty much create a shopping cart of whatever they need. It could be books, it could be um, computer technology, it could be anything from their vendors. Um, you put a shopping cart together and then you just send a link out to the world and people just fund your need. And once your need is met, all of a sudden you have a box, a shipment um, in your classroom. And basically all they ask for you to do is send a thank you note. Um, either from just a teacher or the students and picture of the students actually using what you requested. So that's the way that I've been using technology to really show my students that hey, people out there in the real and outside of our community believe in you. Uh, people really want to help uh, fund your education and really give you these resources that we really can't get with the budget cuts and things like that. And so that's been a really powerful thing within my classroom. Do you have anything up there right now, Annie? I don't. Know, I just. It's really exciting. Um, I had one in the summer, and I had a five hundred dollar project filled within not even twenty four hours. Um, so it's really interesting and exciting to see people really just jump on things. And um, this is my third project, and um, I share this a lot with the people in my cohort program, and they started it. And you know, just because they're they're doing things in their classroom that I really believe in and I'll donate to them. So it's been really interesting and exciting to see that. So I definitely recommend everyone um, go into that and create uh, create for their own projects and uh, receive from the larger community. Annie, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, so if you, how does it work with your district when you get something from this website, if someone else pays for it for you, how does that work with you? Because, for example, I know if I got, say, an iPad, I would still need district permission to let the kids use it and put the apps on and all that stuff. So, how did that work with your district? Or yeah, how did you we actually it? had. Uh, um, I only do books because that's the biggest thing that I need. But we actually mm -hmm. had another teacher use technology, and they um, okayed it with our principal and the administrators first. And they okayed it with the technology department, like, are you going to be able to help with these things? And so they were able to do that. But according to the contract with Donors Choose, the products that you receive from these projects, you as a teacher who created the project, you do not own. The school owns it. So if you do ever leave your building, the rules are you're allowed to take it with you if the school that you're going to is of more need, has a higher need for it than the school that you came from. Oh, okay. Does that answer your question? Ben? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Uh, Jeffrey Fisher, do you want to do a sound check there? Welcome. Hey, how you doing? There you go. Introduce yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Jeff Fisher. Um, I'm from Southern Michigan. Um, I'm a high school social studies teacher. Um, that's about it. <laughs> what did you do this summer? What brings you here? Um, well, uh, I was in the second year summer cohort um, at Michigan State with Annie. We were partners. Um, so did some really cool things this summer. It was a lot different than our first year that we had, um, but I really enjoyed it. So I think there are several questions on the table. So whatever piqued your interest, who would like to 
jump on one of the questions. There, there are questions about, you know, technology or just is it something else and does technology just support the other bigger change that's happening in some way? No prejudice in that question. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, or, you know, what's, what's that all about? And then, and then the other big question, like, um, how is innovation coming into your classroom? Um, the, based on some summer experience. Those are a couple that I think of, but anything else anybody wants to jump on there? I guess technology allows us to do things that aren't possible without its use. So um, one of the big things that I'm focused on this year is uh, visible thinking and getting my kids' ideas and really tracking their learning and so using the iPads and apps like um, explain everything. The kids can explain their thinking and create little videos and post them on their blogs and share them with parents and really create a e-portfolio of you know how they've developed as a learner over the year um, which without the um, technology is not as possible. Um, so that's one tool and then I use Skype or Google Hangouts a lot in my classroom to bring experts in the classroom. So if we're doing a rocks and minerals unit, we Skype with a geologist. When we're studying ancient civilizations, we Skype with an archaeologist. So kind of teaching the kids that there are people out there that are much better resources than the teacher is, and the teacher isn't the holder of the knowledge. And, you know, I'm just a tool to teach them how to learn. And there's, you know, people out there that they can contact and kind of empower them to use the technology to do things that weren't possible without its use. And I think um, Marcy's kind of understating her use of it, I think, because really I've seen, um, she has, someone did a video about your class. They were in it, I think the, was he a paleontologist or something who came to visit, you know, he came remotely, and, but the video shows the kids and how so excited they are to talk to this guy, but also how much they brought to it and how much they learned in the process. So a lot, a theme that's running throughout tonight is connections. And so Marcy, um, can you just say a little bit more about how you get those people there and the effect that has on your students? Yeah, so um, I usually find people on Twitter and I just message them and ask if they'd be willing to Skype with my class. And then through email or, or Twitter, we'll set up a time. And um, the, usually there's a couple emails back and forth kind of giving them an overview of what, what we're looking at. And they'll send me some ideas. And then um, my kids just ask them questions. So obviously there's some learning how to ask questions that goes into that before. And then um, they ask the archaeologist or the geologist questions. And they get responses. and they show them pictures, and um, then we'll email them after if there's, you know, questions that come up later in our unit. I teach at a very inquiry-based um, school. We do the um, International Baccalaureate Primary Years Program, so it's a, a lot about student empowerment and student um, student-driven instruction. So I find that it's a great way to empower them to, you know, be owners of their learning. Very cool. Marcy, and you're with your fourth graders all day kind of thing? Or? Yeah, I have them um, for most of the day. I have a prep time, but um, we That's teach nice. as <laughs> transdisciplinary, so we try and interweave all the subjects together. Um, so I have good chunks of time that we can kind of work away at. Mm -hmm. I got a question I'm for to you. I'm the video of my class, Oops. and I'll post it. Good. Uh, like, what suggestions would you have for, like, you know, that sounds like really cool to do because, you know, science is kind of hands-on and you can get some really good ideas from that. But what suggestions would you have for, like, me, for example, who's a social studies teacher? Um, how do you get kids engaged with, like, a, maybe a politician, which they might not find as interesting? I mean, what, what do you do before or behind the scenes to gear them for that? Yeah, so a lot of it is about... Um, teaching them how to ask questions and really developing good questions before they um, ask the person. So the archaeologist that we talk with, it's um, about, we look at ancient civilization, so that's historically based, and about how, um, you know, the process of becoming an archaeologist and what they actually do, um, 
talk about the kind of expeditions they've been on and the kind of thinking processes that they use um, that, you know, that they do in their daily job. So that's um, what, what I focus on for mine. We do it all interwoven. I don't really separate science and social studies. So we can look at the science components and the social components of a unit. Makes sense. And ancient civilizations is one example. Can you uh, another example of a, one of those interwoven units? Um, yeah. So right now we're doing a unit on children's rights, and so we're looking at um, human rights around the world. And um, so I guess it's more socials based, but we do look at life expectancy, water quality. Mm -hmm and how all those things contribute to um, lifespan and access to those things. Sounds and like a lot so, of math is getting weaved in there too. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fascinating, Marcy. Thanks. Any other examples? You can jump us. I'm fascinated to hear a couple more. <laughs> yeah. For others. Who else would like to talk about their, what's, what's on your mind? Jump in here, folks. We have about eight minutes left, and we want to get as much out here as we can. Um, I've started a new project this year. Cool. Um, I, got a, I got some money from a, a Title I director, and I received 26 iPads uh, for my classroom. Um, and I was really excited about it, and so what I wanted to do is I wanted to use um, I wanted to use a combination of iPads and Google Drive together um, as a way for kids to keep their notes all in one spot, um, to turn in their homework to me in shared folders through Google Docs, um, and I, I, you know I, I typed up all these directions and I had all these plans in, in set in place and. Um, at first, it was really tough to get the kids going. Um, you know, I figured that a lot of them would already know a lot about the iPads, um, but I had to explain a lot about you know how to use just the guts of it. Um, then we had to set up some emails, which was a, which was much harder than I had thought and anticipated. Um, but it's been a week and a half they're, now, and it seems to be off and running, and um, they're we're, getting, we're getting the hang of it. They're setting up their own Google accounts, or. Right, yeah, yeah. The the older kids are. The younger kids are kind of still behind a little bit. Mm -hmm. But it, it seems to be going pretty good, and uh, I just like it because it allows them to, you know, uncover information by themselves. So, you know, if I just say, okay, here's three minutes, I want you to go look something up, it's really quick and easy, and um, it's working out okay for now. Hey, Jeff, was that inspired by your last project that you did? Yeah, partially. Um, you know, I just I, I kind of wanted to go a little bit paperless, um, and I was I, I always saw my kids, you know, losing assignments or losing their notebook or you know it was disorganized. They didn't know where all their stuff was at, and so I figured if they had some type of central location where they could put all their stuff, um, you know, they have a shared homework folder with me. They have a folder for their class. They have a folder for their notes. So it's all right there. And uh, with the, the really the kind of the cool thing I'm seeing is that now kids are starting to use that in other classes. So now instead of just having a government folder, now they have a chemistry folder. Now they have a physics folder. And so now they're beginning to see that you know it's it's useful. Uh, they like the organization and structure of it. Are you working with other teachers to do that, or? Um, there have been a few that have came and asked me for some advice, um, but this is something I'm kind of tackling by myself because I'm still trying to figure it out, and I don't want to throw it on other people um, without them knowing any basis on it at all. Mm -hmm. So, cool. For me, one of the things I'm trying in my classroom is trying to gamify my classroom a little bit more. Um, that seems to be a big thing that we talked about a little bit. So, like, for example, um, in my programming classes that we're doing is set it up like a video game. When they get to a certain level, they achieve, um, like, a, a novice badge or an apprentice badge or a journeyman's badge, and then it keeps going up and up, and I notice that the kids are working independently trying to get to the next level of that. Like that idea is over on, I think it's on uh, classtap.com in terms of how that works. And then um, another one is, is like in my, um, I set my 
my basic computer classes up so it's like a big monopoly board so the kids um, buy their that buy their workstation and then they um, or else rent it from me and I give us money for their assignments virtual money and then they keep a spreadsheet total of it and they if they buy it they can pay insurance and disasters happen occasionally and um, <laughs> if they don't have insurance then they have um, lose some money. So it kind of is an economics lesson built in there as well. So we have a store at the end in Google Docs we do something where we have an online auction um, so all of the kids can buy treasures that people have donated through garage sales and stuff with their virtual money. So that'd be a piece that, that, that I'm kind of trying to develop a little bit more. So Renee have you uh, been doing that? You've been starting doing that? I started it um, a little bit last year, and I just am I'm trying to tweak that a little bit and modify it and get it going a little bit better and a little bit better as I'm going through it. Um, one of the things that I had looked into while I was at Michigan State was um, was was the gamification piece. That was something that we were assigned, and it intrigued me. So, just expanded on it. And so, what the little that you've done so far, though, I mean, what kinds of changes do you see? Um, you know, can you compare between the way things used to be and the way they are now? And the kids are very, very motivated. <laughs> they want to um, move ahead if they can. I'm, I'm not re because I um, it's I try to have them be independent learners. They I, I don't um, stand up and lecture. I facilitate more so. So they're moving through my course at their natural speed. I have deadlines that they need to meet, but some of the kids really get moving <laughs> because they want they want those um, those dollars or else they want to get to the next badge. Um, it, it just seems to, to um, motivate them um, and make it fun. So when they walk in your room, they know what they're going to do that day? Um, they do. <laughs> mm -hmm. They do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do. That's cool. The, the, that's, those are some of the biggest shifts in talking to other teachers about, okay, my school was dedicated to having everybody with a computer and curriculum online and so forth. And, and it's not about using the technology. It's about... Sh like making the curriculum available like you've done, Renee, and then becoming a helper through that curriculum instead of the deliverer of that curriculum. And that's a big shift I think a lot of people are doing. I, I think for me the, that's something that has to be taught to the kids. I mean, they don't just come in and automatically do that. It's something that has to be it's like okay, here's where we start, and we keep I keep moving them through that process so that they mm -hmm. they learn how to become independent thinkers. You know, it's not 100% successful, but you know they're 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 getting there. <laughs> but it seems like there needs to be a fair fair balance between you know just the self directed learner self directed learning and student centered. I mean, I feel like you know a lot of times when people say you know. That that they don't lecture, like the lecturing, lecturing has a bad connotation added to it. I think, you know, a lot of times that, you know, if you're good at lecturing, I mean, not saying lecture the whole class, I think it can be beneficial for students. Um, but obviously you do need to include the student-centered piece in it as well. Which we have those is. teachable moments where it's like um, things are coming up. Um, this is a good place to discuss things with the whole entire class and where we're at. and. Um, uh -huh. The kids are always bringing new ideas and new things up that that we do discuss and talk about. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think we're up to getting last thoughts, um, if we can. Um, I, I, we don't always do this, but and there are many of us, but maybe we can. Let's let's just go down the line and just uh, get your last thoughts as we go. I mean, we just opened up a real interesting can of worms, and I want to argue with you a little bit, Jeffrey. But um, anyway, <laughs> but uh, I'll lecture you later about that. Sure. <laughs> <Fair. tricky>. um, <laughs> So, but 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 let's um, let's just start up the up at the top with Andy again. Just any sort of last thoughts of um, what uh, what you're thinking about having had this conversation again with uh, some of your colleagues. Sure. Um, I think a big thought that comes to my mind as I'm looking over some of the chats uh, from the chat room 
-hmm. is um, someone was asking me about the flipped classrooms. And my first real interaction with flipped classrooms was about two and a half years ago. And then my first year uh, in the cohort program. And the thing about this program and the networking that we do, it it's always changing. I'm always learning new things. And so the great thing about just the connection that I made with everybody, I think I've also started following every single one in this chat room already. It's knowing that there's a network of people that I can go to about anything, that we are really in education with the right purposes and wanting to do the right thing. And so um, I just feel like it's really uh, exciting and it's an encouragement. And I'm still a fairly new teacher. And um, just to learn how to incorporate these things but also be a leader within my building, I'm very um, excited to take this all back and continue that growth. Yeah, well, I, and this will be my last thought. And then we'll go one, one of the questions or themes that has come up a lot um, here tonight is how we're working with our colleagues as well as with our, our own yeah. students. So that's been interesting. Blair, um, just kind of to go off of what you said a little bit when you said, you know, we are not always the deliverers of content. Students need to, you know, make their own meaning. Or, I don't know that I, I gathered that from everybody talking. And the way I've kind of approached this year is to, you know, when I approach each unit, to think about, um, you know, how could I improve this? You know, what's my problem of practice? And can technology help me solve that problem? So now I'm thinking in my head right now, well, that's kind of a problem because I do deliver a lot more content to the students as opposed to them getting it on their own. So now I'm pondering that. Yeah. You know, at that last week's show, somebody mentioned the um, smoke and mirrors uh, about art teachers. It's a and, and I did read the article. It's a wonderful article. Um, I'll put I'll put it up with the link from last week's show and Please. this week's too. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Um, I think it's from Art Teacher magazine. But, and, and the big title, Smoke and Mirrors. And it's all about um, art teachers, like, moving away from doing cookie cutter, look, here's this yeah. here's this artist, and let's make stuff like, you know, let's all make a Picasso portrait today. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, that's yeah. my pet peeve, is cookie cutter projects. And yeah. that's one reason why I try to let them be creative within those requirements, because mm -hmm. I don't like them to look all the same. That, Oh, yeah. I hate that. Hate and that. we do the same in English too, often. Yeah. But, yeah. but those are interesting questions. Jeffrey, sorry, last thoughts. Uh, kind of came Chris, in a little you bit. You can have final last thoughts. Okay, good. I'll be ready for that. <laughs> um, kind of came in a little bit late, but uh, I was kind of excited to hear. I like the gamification idea that um, Renee had mentioned. Um, I think that'd be something I would try to like to do. I think I'm just trying to do too much right now. Um, too many big changes, and maybe I just need to stick with one thing. See what works, see what doesn't work, and move on. You know, to the next year. I think I get myself wrapped up in too much stuff, and I get too overwhelmed. So, uh, I'm kind of curious what everybody else has to say. Lorna. Um, I well, think I. Not Lauren. Lauren, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, I think I have to echo uh, Annie's uh, sentiment about uh, our personal learning network, and you know, that's one thing that I've taken with me and been able to keep and has been such an invaluable resource and I think sometimes we forget the value of you know connecting ourselves to good people and connecting ourselves to good tools and how that can you know absolutely change our perspective on things and, and just really challenge us to grow um, you know one of uh, the things we we had to look into um, for one of our projects was a wicked problem of, of failure and learning and being able to fail um, and I think taking a look at um, at that and, and failure and learning in myself, I've seen that a lot this year, and I've seen myself taking more risks with technology. Um, and and with that, I've seen, you know, yes, I've had some failures, um, but I think overall there's going to be a lot of growth um, from opening myself up to, to allowing myself to make mistakes and creating that environment in my classroom for my students as well. Well, thanks for joining us, Bob. Uh, well, I kind of took a couple notes as we were going along. Um, one thing that stuck in my head was using technology with a purpose, um, not just to use technology, just to use it. It's got to have an integral part in what you're trying to accomplish and the end goal. Um, not being worried about trying new things. It may be a flop. It may not be a flop, but not to be afraid to try new things. Um, keeping students as part of the learning process, not just you know spitting it out at them, but let them become an integral part of um, what you're teaching, what you're learning, and the process itself. Um, 
And then lastly, this is my first time in Google Hangouts, and I'm pretty stoked. I'm going to try this out to use for review sessions, other things, to get my students communicating with one another and with me. Um, so I'm pretty pretty excited about that. Just a few things there, Bob. That's cool. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Marcy, fourth um, grade is my favorite for, favorite grade. It goes to downhill after that. Uh, so. <laughs> but uh, your classroom no. sounds wonderful. It's a great year. <laughs> Last thoughts, yeah. Um, so one of the things that I was reminded of was a big discussion that we had this summer about teachers as kind of learning architects or learning engineers and you know designing the learning experience and. Um, how critical that is. I've only had, this is only our third day of school today, so I'm looking forward to having a chance to kind of get things going. We just got the iPads out today and the kids were stoked and ready to go, so um, it's going to be a, a good road ahead, but lots of work to do still. Yay. Well, third day of school. I've been in school for five weeks already, so it's been quite a different. Um, but one of the things that I really, you know, realize, like talking in a group like this, like we're we're all up on the technology and can and can do everything that we want to. You know, we can get into Google Hangouts, we can get on the Google Drive, and then just going back to school with all those teachers that they've never done that kind of stuff. It's just it takes a little bit of like you got to meet them and you got to meet the kids where they are. And bring them up to where you want them to be, rather than just jumping in with all this technology right away. You kind of have to like um, do bit by bit before you can, you know, go all the way out. Thank you, and Renee. Any last thoughts? I have a couple things. Um, a couple people had mentioned the collaborate collaboration personal learning network um, and how that's changed so much and for me that's really huge um, there's so much out there it's like I want to change so many things with that I, I know that I want to come figure out some way or another that I want my students to be able to build a personal learning network as well not just those social networks but a personal learning network so they can they can experience the same types of things that I am and I'm not quite sure how to do that when they're under the age of 13 so that's one of the things I got to figure out in addition I love what Marcy's doing um, with taking something and making it totally interdisciplinary um, for me that's going to be another challenge of mine teaching technology classes it's like how do you pull that all together so and make it interdisciplinary and that made me think about the smarter balanced assessment and and how to how do I measure student growth with project based learning and it's like how do I get all that together so all of these ideas tonight kind of has inspired to me look to look a little bit further still even though there's a lot I'm trying it's 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 overwhelming but it's fun I, I know we're way over time, but can I, can I sneak in an editorial comment about that 13 thing? The, the, the reason for that law, I, for my, for what I understand, is that um, we don't want Facebook and other people collecting information about kids that are that young and then selling it. It's not about there's anything wrong with them being online, right? So um, the only thing the law requires is that parents sign off and that they're okay to use the site. And Facebook can even do that, but they don't want to, right? They 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 want it. They want to push till they can start using that stuff. So youthvoices.net, we have lots of kids on there who are younger than 13, and we'd love to um, have you jump on there because it's not against the law to have kids on there younger than 13 as long as they're there's a parent sign off and we will not collect their information and sell it to advertisers. Um, so there, there's my little, but seriously, um, Thank thinking about what, what that law is about is, is, is worth thinking about. You know, it's to protect the kids, but it's not to silence the kids. So we need to get the kids' voices out there. But yeah. Chris, you get last thought after that. All right. So. Well, you know, <laughs> had a little bit of free time today. So, you know, I was doing some reading lately about, you know, teacher reform. You know, it's on everyone's mind and that. And I hadn't read Finnish Lessons, you know, Finland, uh, Finnish Lessons, What the World Can Learn About Educational Change in Finland, right? So I was reading a little bit from that one. And then I wandered to Sir Ken Robinson, who I uh, referenced earlier, and he had this great quote. I put the uh, link to this article in the chat room from Huffington Post. Um, but it was, I like, there's one part of it that says, teachers need mentors too. Supporting educators to become the best they can be is one of the surest routes to improving the nation's schools. 
in my view, we should then give them the creative freedom to innovate and do their jobs within a proper framework of public accountability. And really, I mean, that summarizes so much of what we've been talking about tonight. So um, thank you. I mean, if we want to know how to reform schools, I think the answers are right here. Chris Sloan, thank you for making this a sourced show. I appreciate that, not just our opinions. <laughs> no, seriously, that's, that's very useful. Thank you all for hanging out a little extra time here. Um, we do meet here every Wednesday night. I uh, want to invite you back anytime you'd like to come. Um, and um, we meet uh, as part of the EdTechTalk dot com uh, network of the World Bridges Network channel, the World Bridges Network, and uh, you can also find us at TeachersTeachingTeachers dot org uh, later. Um, and we want to thank Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier for setting up that community several years ago. And we'll see you all again soon. I hope. Talk to you. Thanks, Chris, for helping us uh, bring yeah, in some of you, your friends everybody. here. Yeah, thank you, everybody here. So good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night. Thank you.